Okay, so in X-Men, why are they mutants? How do they become mutants? Yeah. Yeah. Say what? What does that mean? What do you mean the evolution of <coughs> Right, there's an adaption, I think is a term we use a lot in the movie, right? So, uh, we, the movie talks about how we have taken humans, and humans, through the natural process of evolution, have changed. They just happen to get really super cool powers. Right? That's their shit. Uh, to me, that is debate. Debate has fundamentally gone through that same evolution, where it was once one, and there are plenty of people that still think it should be that way, but it has progressed to be what most people would think is more liberal, right? So we've included things like philosophical criticisms of planned action. And that largely <coughs> dislike by uh, let's say more people. So who's scared of the K? Like you're terrified. Right? You can totally say yes, because I dislike the K most of the time. Yeah? Why are you scared of it? I have a question. That's not... Okay, well, I mean, I, I, I had a question at the same time that you asked. Well, that's crazy. So who else hates the K? <laughs> Why? It's such a, like, all this high argument. You can do anything that you want to do. It's cheating. It's cheating. It's cheating. The K is cheating. That's why you hate it. It's true. It is cheating. Okay. Yeah! 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 Here's the thing you have to learn. That's the debate, my friends. That is debate. There are no rules to debate besides you have to speak for eight minutes, three minutes, and five minutes. Right? Now there are rule books that exist. There are rule books that exist, right, that say, here is the top here's what the rule is. But really at the end of the day, it depends on who's judging you in the back of the room and what they believe debate to be. And what you all debate debate to be. Does that make sense? So don't be scared. My goal by the end of the next 45 minutes. It's to make you not absolutely terrified of the kid. Okay? So I have two things that I want to accomplish in this lecture. The first one is I will insert discussions of topic criticisms. And we'll talk about some of the K's that we're talking and writing about at the camp, so that when you have these practice debates and the K lab just starts talking about like ontological, epistemological, foundation, whatever, right? You can understand maybe what they're talking about. <coughs> the second thing that I want to do is I want you all to ask whatever questions you want to know about the critique. Whether that is the structure of the critique, whether that is a critique author you don't know about, whether that is a debate where you're like, I just don't get why we lost this debate, explain this to me. Or, you want to become a better K-debater and just sadly do not pick the critique lab, uh, I can <coughs> kind of help you with those questions. Does that sound good? Yeah. Seems like you all have way more questions about like the K itself rather than maybe like what Virilio says. Because yeah. I don't care what Virilio says. <laughs> right? Okay, so let's do that first. What are... Well, let me give you my idea of what I think a critique is. And maybe Andy might have stolen my analogy. Uh, talk about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X? Yeah. Oh, he stole my analogy. Okay, so I view debate like a debate between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. What, uh, who's Malcolm X? <laughs> what? He was more of an aggressive civil rights leader, right? Malcolm, Malcolm Luther, uh, Luther King said, no peaceful approach. So if you got them in a room, they would both agree that racism is probably really, really bad, right? But what fundamentally differentiates those two is a methodology question. How do we go about resolving the problems we have proposed exist? That to me is debate 101. That is what debate is. As says, methodology exists, somehow we use the federal government to pass some piece of legislation that would do X good things. That is a methodology, right? The critique is a different methodology for viewing the world. So a lot of times debate, debaters have this tendency to be like, we're a social movement. No, you're not a social movement. That's just not true. Or we're a revolution. No, you're still not a revolution. Not happening. Right? The way that I've always sold it in, in debates is, and I think it's the easiest way to do it is, at the end of the day, we just have to question whether or not the affirmative team is good or bad. And if we present a different methodology for how we can resolve those questions, the negative should win this debate. For example, if we can prove that the affirmative team is capitalist, and that that capitalist ide ideology leads to X, Y, Z bad things, a methodology that says capitalism is bad, removes ourselves from capitalism, we should reject instances of capitalism, those are specific methodologies that would be better than doing planned action. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, no, maybe so? Yes. <coughs> Got one. 
You don't have to agree. I'm not asking if you agree, because I don't really agree all the time. But does that understand a way of explaining and criticism? So it doesn't sound like you have to have like a social rally after the debate rounds, like gather people determined to fight capitalism. No. I just have to win that systems of capitalism are bad, the 1AC is part of that, and the way in which we can break that down is to reject it, to reimagine, to reconceptualize, insert the big K buzzword here. Yeah? <coughs> All right, what are, let's do some questions. What are like, thank you to question. What was your question in general? Uh, Speak up. No, you had a question that you wanted to talk about. It's answered already? Yeah. Well, what was it? It's answered. Okay. All right. I'm comfortable. Um, all right, what are some other questions then? What? Everyone loves the K. People are scared of the K. What's, what's, what do you want to know? What's your favorite K? Not yet. You want to ask any questions about the K? We'll know it. Yeah. Sure, we can start there. If you have questions, interrupt me. I had a couple topics on this would be uh, uh, international criticisms. And that's probably a lot of what you've seen already. Uh, the, I think a big one would clearly be the security criticism that <coughs> Andy did talk about during his like mini lecture, correct? Yeah. Do you have any questions about the security K itself? The security K rests on this assumption of constructivism. Does anyone know what constructivism is? It's pretty self identical. What? Well, can I go? That's correct. I'm going to find the other one. I think it's a good one. We make threats so we can justify security. Yeah, think about it in this way. Constructivism says the world is not, does not have one totalized truth. It says that the world is constructed, <coughs> fabricated, represented, controlled by gender, it's controlled by capitalism, it's controlled by security discourse, it's controlled by the representations we have about proliferation, the representations we have about nuclear war. Those are all how we come to know the world, how it is constructed for us to interpret it. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes? This is like international relations theory that some people are learning college, so I need to know if you don't understand. Okay. Uh, the, so there's the security thing. The second one that is oftentimes big on international topics is uh, what I call gender IR. There's been two different kinds of gender uh, criticisms in debate. The first one is what I'll call feminist international relations, which was being kind of in the early 90s, not throughout the 90s in debate, which was at its most basic core, if we include females, what we know as the sex of females, into international politics, because of their connections to things like peace and nurturing and all those terrible assumptions about women, uh, Thus, when we include them into politics, it makes politics more peaceful. It makes it uh, so that we don't have wars anymore. <coughs> Women think emotionally. So when they have these big political conversations, they'll be like, no, but war's bad. As if men can't do that. Right? I need this to find out a little bit. Okay. Uh, so their alternative is to literally just include women into international relations. Now, that physical inclusion of women into politics can foster things like more stability, more peace, uh, arms control agreements, those types of things. There was a backlash against this in feminist literature uh, that said that that understanding is essentialist. Does anyone know what that means? Okay. Yeah? Uh, it, essentialism is like an overgeneralization of a certain group of people. Correct. Feminist said, a new wave of feminist said, that's essentialist because it assumes that women are peaceful. It assumes that women have innately biological traits that make them more akin to say, don't kill people. And the problem is, is not that that assumption is bad, but that women have innate traits tied to their sexuality is bad. Because it ignores things like a masculine female, or a feminine male, or transgenders, or intersex that that assumption uh, allows us to say, you know what a female is, and thus, therefore, I know what I am not. Does that make sense? Because I know what a female is, someone who is P 
peaceful, hates war, close to the nature, I know that that's not me, that you have become different than me. I'm allowed to exclude you because I know you are a woman. You have an identifiable characteristic that allows you to differentiate yourself from me. Does that make sense? So what? Uh, yes? I'm confused. Okay. About what? Um, I don't get this essentialist thing. Which? Like, like in I don't, general? I, yeah. Okay. Uh, feminists said that if we include women in IR, that they can stop war and peace. The reason they believe that to be true is because there was an understanding that women are innately more peaceful than men. Because <coughs> they have a womb and carry children, so they won't kill anyone because they understand. The reason you're laughing is the essentialist argument. That's just not true for everyone. All right. And to think that that is true for everyone is worse. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the same reason you laughed at what I said that is the same reason why it is essential. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes? So then is it wrong to call someone a woman? <laughs> well, that's the debate we have. Plenty of people. Uh, critics like Judith Butler say that our gender identity is a total performance. Right? What does it mean when we perform our identity? So over the K-Lab should probably answer. Yeah? Like you're expressing? Like how you express it? Yeah, it's a performance of this. Uh, right? The only reason uh, I perform masculinity, whatever that means, I play sports, I say bro, I don't know. I wear men's clothing. That is a performance of my gender identity. Is that not? Right? Because it's not necessarily the physical biology of the male, but instead what I am putting out to you all. <coughs> not sure. Um, but the debate we had is so, like, the question is what's a woman? Does a woman have breasts? Does a woman carry babies? Does a woman, uh, is she peaceful? Is she nurturing? <coughs> right? Those ideas of what is a woman, Judith Butler questions. But she says that it's not a static understanding of what a woman is. Because it ignores things like feminine males or masculine females. Yeah? Will it ever be right to like, define what a woman is? Yeah, there's a new way of, and this is why critical theory is so dumb, there's a new way of critical literature called anti-anti-essentialism. <laughs> I know, right? Anti-anti-essentialism. And what they do is it's a huge backlash against this postmodern thought that identities are all fluid, that they're only constructed, that no one really has a static identity because it's all intersex. No. They say there is an identity of a woman, and some people have to have to use that identity for empowerment, right? And what they talk about is for political mobilization. If there is no static definition of a woman, if there's not the ability to say, I am a woman, here's what it is, and here is what I am stuck against because I'm a woman, they can never <coughs> politically mobilize themselves, right? They can never say... Yes, but there's still men that are raping us. And that is, we have to take the identity of women to empower ourselves to say that won't happen. That is a mobilized, like a collective union of women, much stronger than everyone just saying there's no identity. Does that make sense? So that's the, yes? Oh. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, to the way I think about it is social movements. If no one really has an identity, it's not a powerful movement. But if people can coalesce behind one identity and fight for political rights or fight for visibility, it's much more powerful. And that's just the argument that anti anti essentialists make. Yeah? Um, so, from Butler, we read as a counter K with MIR. Totally. Most of the time it is, I believe. That this criticism of gender, uh, these static definitions <coughs> of gender, necessarily uh, create more gender violence, it uh, prevents women from being actually liberated. Yeah, that would be a criticism of the first wave of feminism. The second wave that has become more pronounced in debate these days is just gender and international relations. Right, the first one is feminism and international relations. This one's kind of called gender and international relations. And it steps back from the idea of biological sex to say it is a question of how gender and masculinities and femininities affect choices in international relations. So the example that's oftentimes used is states act in masculine ways because they're all about competition, they're driven for the ego, they don't really care what they do to other people, they're realists, and that, that type of 
fear mongering or war building or nation building is what they would deem masculine. <coughs> it's that sense of rationality that they would criticize. 